Trent Arthelow, John LeMessurier and Clive Dunn in Dad's Army. <laughs> Ten seconds from now, featuring John Larry, Arnold Ridley and Ian Lavender with this week's guests Frank Thornton and Larry Martin. <laughs> Here is the news and this is John Snag reading it. With most of the free world now at war, people everywhere, whatever language they speak, are equal in their determination to resist the fanatical efforts of Adolf Hitler to bring their countries under the Nazi heel. At Warmington-on-Sea, in the headquarters of the local Home Guard unit, Corporal Jones is addressing the platoon. Not now, pay attention. Now, Mr. Manry and Mr. Wilson will not be with us tonight, as they have a lot of work to do at the bank. So I should be taking this evening's lectures which deals with tactics. Oh, good. This might be very useful later tonight. I've got a date with that new barmaid at the Goat and Compasses. <laughs> hey, Joe, is that the young, sonsy, ginger-headed lassie? Yeah, that's the one. Hey, man, fine-looking woman. Just the sort I had off taking my fancy to myself a few years back. <laughs> I expect she's got big, strong thighs. <laughs> I'll let you know in the morning. <laughs> Just be quiet, both of you. I'm talking about military tactics. Now, look at this diagram I have drawn on the board. Now, these squares represent... Come on, hurry up, Private Pike. You're late. Yeah, get a move on, Pike. The old Jones here is telling us about tactics. Oh, that's what they have at race courses, isn't it? <laughs> That's Tic Tacs. Oh. Private Pike, why aren't you in uniform? Oh, I, I'm not stopping, see. I've got to go back to the bank and help to get ready for the auditors. I've only come down because I've got a message for you from Mr Manorine. Yeah. Why didn't Captain Manorine send you down? He, he could have just telephoned us. Private Godfrey, I won't tell you again. Stop talking. It's the first time I've said anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's beside the point. I still shan't tell you again. Anyway, Pike, what's the message? Well, he's expecting a very important phone call. From the BBC. What on earth do you want the Bexhill Bread Company for? <laughs> no, Mr. Jones, the proper BBC, you know, the wireless people. What's it all about then, son? Well, I'm, I'm not supposed to know, actually, but I heard Mr. Mary and Uncle Arthur talking about it. <laughs> if I tell you, do you promise to keep it to yourself? Oh, yeah, 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 cross your hearts and hope to die. I don't mind crossing my heart, but at my age, hoping to die it seems to be rather tempting providence. <laughs> Well, that means you're only half doing it, Mr. Godfrey. Well, that's all right. You can only half listen. <laughs> come on, come on. Get on with it, Pike. Oh, all right. Now, you know Ed Murrow's programme where he talks to people in other countries? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they're going to do a special one called To Absent Friends, where, where allied soldiers all around the British Empire, and e even as far as America, they send greetings to each other. It's going to be on September the 3rd to coincide with the third anniversary of the war being declared on her Hitler. Oh, this is all very interesting, son, but what's it got to do with Captain Munnig and why is the BBC going to telephone us? Well, it's to tie up the arrangements, you see. What arrangements? We are going to be part of the broadcast. When they say greetings from a home guard unit somewhere on the south coast of England, that'll be us. Oh. Fancy that. <laughs> anyway, you won't tell anybody, will you, because it's a secret. And don't forget, Mr Jones, when the BBC ring, take down the details, or at least take a message. All right, Pikey, yes, we'll do that. Well, I'll be off now. Cheerio. Yeah, cheerio. Yes. Well, well, the BBC, eh? <laughs> there were no holding manner in after this. Well, now, don't worry about that, Private Pacey. Let's get back to my lecture. Now, where, where was I? Who is it? It's only me, sir. Ah, oh, come in, Wilson. Have a seat. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, go on, then. Sit down. What? Well, whereabouts? I mean, there's, a, there's only one chair in here, and you've got that. Ah, yes, of course. A BBC engineer chap is using my other chair in the hall. Ah. Well, we'll just have to stand. Yes, well, perhaps I could just sort of um, uh, squat on the corner of your desk. No, 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 no. no I'm afraid not, Wilson, no. That sort of thing's very bad for discipline. <laughs> I tell you what. Lean on the filing cabinet. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Well, how are things going in there? Oh, yes. Yes, of course, yes. That's what I care to tell you. Bert says he's just uh, got a couple of adjustments to make, and then they'll be ready to rehearse. Bert? Hmm. Who's Bert? Well, he, uh, he's the BBC engineer. An awfully nice chap. He gave me a woodbine. <laughs> <laughs> Now, look, Wilson. Yes, sir. This Home Guard unit has been specially chosen to broadcast a message to millions of people listening not only in this country, but abroad. 
Now, that puts us in a rather privileged position. Well, what about it? Well, it's just that I think it would be better if we didn't hobnob with the technicians, that's all. Oh, really, sir? Oh, you can scoff, Wilson. <laughs> Take it from me. Always wise to try and keep one's end up. Yes, well, be that as it may, but he seems a very pleasant sort of chap. He's been telling me about how he met the king just before the war. Met the king? Yes, the king, <laughs> yes. Yes, that's right. He was the engineer on one of the Christmas Day broadcasts. Apparently, at one point, there was a bit of a delay, and Bert and, and the king had a long chat about gardens. Really? Yes, and also about stamp collecting. You see, Bert's father and the king's father were both very keen on philately. Were they really? Yes, they were. <laughs> <laughs> uh, come in. Excuse me, Mr. Manreen. What is it, Pike? They're ready for the rehearsal. Oh, all right. Tell, uh, tell Bert we're just coming. <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, by the way, sir, uh, have you any idea what we're actually going to be saying during this broadcast? I mean, have you seen the script? No, not yet. I've no doubt the BBC have it all in hand. Well, let's go in. Mustn't keep the technicians waiting. Oh, no. Well, after you, sir. <laughs> you are Mr. Marion, Uncle Arthur. These are your copies of the script. I've dished the rest out. Well done, Pike. Oh, excuse me, sir. Ah, oh, Bert. <coughs> <laughs> what can I do for you? Uh, could I ask you and your men to gather around the stand microphone and then I'll explain to them what's going to happen? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, pay attention, man. Gather around the, uh, the, uh, the mic. The engineer here, Bert, <laughs> wants to say a few words. All right, sir. Right, sir. right gentlemen. I'm the engineer looking after the technical side of this particular insert into this special programme. And I sit in front of the OBA-8. That's the technical gubbins over there. And the producer, who's in the studio in London, talks to me through headphones. However, during the rehearsals, and until we actually go on the air, the producer will talk to you direct, and you'll be able to hear him through that loudspeaker behind you. Is that clear? Yes, perfectly clear. Good. Well, I'll just put my headphones on, then I'll switch us through to London. Jolly good. <coughs> you know, Wilson, mm -hmm. I think this is going to be quite an interesting experience. Oh, yes, I quite agree, sir. I think London's coming through now. Hello, Warmington. One, two, three, four. That's not right, Mr. Manning. Our phone number's Warmington 333. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's not a telephone number, Jones. I think we're just testing. Oh, I see. Good afternoon, everyone. Now, my name is Willoughby Triton hyphen Maxwell. <laughs> Blimey. If he took that to a chemist, they'd make it up for him. <laughs> Your producer. <laughs> now, uh, this broadcast, which you are part of, will be heard as far away as the United States of America, and your contribution will come just before His Majesty the King's speech. Hear that, Wilson? Just before the King's speech. What an honour. Yes, indeed, sir. Awfully good. Mm. Uh, are your men all ready, Captain Manning? Yes, all ready. Uh, sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Uh, just a minute, London. Captain Mannering, that's the producer's loudspeaker you're talking into. Oh. Speak into the microphone, please. Oh, right. <laughs> yes, of course. Sorry. Uh, this is the microphone, Mr. Mannering, this thing here. Do you see the way he tore his headphones off? <laughs> I'd be very grateful if you didn't touch the microphone. It sets up a terrible din which goes through my headphones and gives me a shocking headache. <laughs> very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> will, will, will you note that, everybody? Don't touch the microphone. Gives Bert a shocking headache. <laughs> Thank you very much, Captain Manley. Now, I, I'd like to try a voice test. Will someone speak, please? Go on, Wilson. Uh, well... What shall I say? Well, don't ask me. Ask the producer. Yeah, well, how, how do I do that? Well, you speak it here, Mr. Wilson. This is the microphone. Oh. <laughs> Are you there, Captain Mannering? Captain Mannering, that, that nearly deafened me, and I have most sensitive ears. I'm so sorry. I, I think the engineer did ask you to refrain from doing that. Yes, yes, of course. Don't do that, Jones. Mr. Uh, uh, what, uh, hyphen Trout has very, <laughs> very sensitive ears. I'm oh, sorry, Mr. Manning, I forgot. Could we carry on with the voice test now, please? Well, what would you like me to say? Do anything you like. Try a nursery rhyme. Yeah, here's one, Mr. Wilson. Mm -hmm. There was a young lady from Buckingham. Did you walk up. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? Uh, this one. Lavender blue, 
Dilly dilly. <laughs> Lavender green. I'll be your king. Dilly dilly. <laughs> if you'll be my queen. <laughs> That was awfully good. <laughs> you really think so? Thank you so much. Oh, you, you, you really have an excellent microphone voice. Oh. Have you ever done any of this sort of thing before? It was at a school I once played the White Rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. Oh, really, really. So did I. Yes. <laughs> what school were you at? But as a matter of fact, I, I well, went to... Look, a... look, could, we... <laughs> could we please get on? Excuse me, Captain Manning. I don't speak into page seven. Do you think I could, I could possibly... Certainly not. <laughs> uh, one more voice test, please. Permission to speak, sir? I should like to volunteer to be one more voice test, sir. Yes, all right, Jones. Thank you, sir. Henny ho hon, henny ho hon, henny 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 ho hon. Oh, I wouldn't, wouldn't give, give you time for your watch chain. Oh, Ryan, oh, Ryan. Yelly la da, billy la da, billy la da, bom bom. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> Let me have a go. Poem by Robbie Burns. <laughs> they are moose. <laughs> we sleek it, cool and timorous beast. Oh, what a panic and night. Birthday. You need to start the wheezy, hasty Rebecca and Brattle. I would believe the run and chase me, the murder and tattle. <laughs> There, sir. Was that nice and clear? <laughs> yes, it was most stimulating. <laughs> well, right, let, let, let's start on the script, please, and I, I want you all to read the lines in perfectly normal, natural voices. <laughs> I stand by, I'll give you a green. I beg your pardon? I said I'll give you a green. A green what? <laughs> the green cue light on the stand that should be in front of you. It, it, it flashes when we want you to start. Oh, I see. What do you do if you want us to stop? Well, I just tell you to stop. Well, in that case, why can't you just tell us to start? <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> anyway, that, 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 that's what we always do. So, right, right, now stand by again, please. Here we go. Hello, soldiers of the Empire. <laughs> I am a home guard commander in charge of a platoon somewhere on the south coast of England. And I'm the sergeant. I'm second in command. And I am the large corporal. I'm third in command. Just a minute, just a minute. Could the officer speak a little more clearly, please? What's the matter? Can't you understand what I'm saying? Well, the fact is, you don't sound very much like an officer. I mean, try to make your voice a little more officerish. <coughs> really? <clears throat> RHQ <laughs> is perched on top of a windswept cliff, looking out across the angry sea. <laughs> Just a minute, please. I'd like to speak to the OB engineer. Uh, Bert, are you there? Oh, excuse me, Captain Manning. Mm. Uh, Bert here, sir. What is it? I shall want the sound effects in at this point. I'm afraid that's going to be a bit difficult, sir. How do you mean? Well, I had a phone call from the effects chaps about half an hour ago. Apparently their van's broken down, so I shouldn't think they're going to make it. But this is absurd. I, I must have wind and water. <laughs> Wait a minute. Uh, Captain Manning? Uh, uh, well, yes, yes. What is it, Mr. Uh, uh, Trueville Waxwall? I mean, <laughs> what is it? Uh, do you think your men could simulate the sound of the sea and the wind? Oh, well, I mean, Mr. I... Mr. Speak, sir, I should like to volunteer to stimulate the surging surf <laughs> sound of the salty sea. Mr. Manning, could I do the seagulls? Shall I make wind, sir? <laughs> One more remark like that, <laughs> you'll be sent off the broadcast. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, blah, blah, Waxville, uh, blah, 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 <laughs> producer, hyphen, you, you, can, uh, <laughs> you can rely on us to supply any sound effect you need. Oh, good. Then let's go back on that last speech, please. And this time we'll try it with the sound effects. Very well. I hit you. It's perched on top of a windswept cliff. Looking across the angry sea. Shh! Fight! Fight! Sir? 
Could you do the seagulls a little lower? <laughs> Get off the floor, you stupid boy. Talking about your voice. Shh. Oh, dear, Mr. Manning. I really think I should have to pop outside. <laughs> Stay where you are, Bob. You people at home are able to sit down and eat your lunch and safety. Away you go, go past the hill. Stop the scene. Blimey, his name's Jones, not Canute. What's the matter, sir? I can't possibly read this script with all that going on. Well, maybe so think. Perhaps Jones could do it a bit further away, sir. Make it a bit more distant. Shall I be the tide that's gone out? <laughs> uh, look, uh, perhaps we'd better rehearse without the sign effects for the time being. Uh, uh, carry on, Captain Mannering. <clears throat> I decide it's time <laughs> for us to go out on patrol. I speak to my sergeant. Sergeant, it's time for us to go out on patrol. Call oh, blimey, sir. <laughs> so it is. And it ain't half cold at all. <laughs> Corporal, it's time for us to go out on patrol. Men, it's time for us to go out on patrol. The men now realise it is time for them to go out on patrol. Uh, just a minute, just a minute. Who, who wrote this rubbish? Did you say something, Captain Mellowing? Yes, I said, who wrote this rubbish? I did, Captain Mellowing. <laughs> Be careful, sir. You know, you remember he can hear every word you say. Come on, lads. We're going out on patrol. And in less time than it takes to tell... The men are marching along cliff top in the teeth of biting wind. Suddenly one of them points and speaks. What's that, Corp? What? What? Oh, look, there's a object floating in the water. True. <laughs> there is an oar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, the man's wrecked the new oh, I. <laughs> said Jock, our Scottish private. <laughs> All eyes appeared out to sea. What can it be? What can it be, Sarge? Call oh, blimey, stun the crows. <laughs> it looks suspicious and all. Look, I don't want to be awkward or difficult, but it really doesn't sound awfully good English to me. You know? it's, <laughs> it's not supposed to be good English. It's supposed to be Cockney. Yeah, but I don't speak with a Cockney accent. Oh. I naturally assumed that being a sergeant, you would. Well, I don't. Oh, dear. Look, I know what. How would it be if the sergeant played the part of the officer and the officer played the part of the sergeant? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think that might sound more natural. Young man. <laughs> I am the officer and he is the sergeant. And it's staying that way. <laughs> Mr. Menrine, I've just been thinking. I haven't got anything to say. Is it because I speak common like you? <laughs> you just carry on being a seagull, Pike. <laughs> and try to make your voice more seagully. Can we take it from the corporal's speech, please? Yes, all right. Right. Well, what can it be? What can it be, Sarge? Oh, blimey, stone the crows. It looks suspicious and all. <laughs> I've got an idea, sir. If you keep me covered, I'll shin down the cliff, <laughs> dodge between those boulders, crawl under the barbed wire, and out along the jetty where I can get a closer deco. Uh, and I'll quickly nip back here and give you the griff. <laughs> Just a minute. Mr. Producer, I don't know whether it matters. You do realise that Private Godfrey is almost 86. <laughs> I'm afraid we can't worry about things like that. After all, the audience can't see him. Now carry on, please. Right, well, scarp her down and take a quick butcher's. I'm off. Oh, blimey. Look at him go and all. <laughs> oh, I is like a wee mounted goat. <laughs> I decided to take no chances. Tell the man to get undercover, Sergeant. All right, Governor. 
Here, Cork, tell the men to get their flipping heads down. Come on, men. You heard what the Sarge said. Take cover. The men moved like a smooth and well-oiled machine. <laughs> Suddenly, above the sound of the surf, we heard the faint cry of Godfrey's voice. All clear. We all heaved a deep sigh of relief. Oh. <laughs> it was a false alarm, but it could have been a Nazi submarine. So, as you sit eating your lunch, think of us. The men of Britain's home guard were on constant watch day and night. Simple men, shopkeepers, factory workers, butchers, bakers. And undertakers. <laughs> James Fraser, 91 High Street, Wandering and Street. <laughs> Reasonable prices, sympathetic attention, tasteful hearts. <laughs> Men, in fact, from all walks of life. We seek no reward, we only do our duty, content in the knowledge that our children and our children's children will grow up to be free men and women. And children. And children. Walk <laughs> up. I shan't warn you again. Right, thank you, everybody. I'll have a couple of minutes' break and then we'll have another go. Now, we must get it right. After all, only another couple of hours, and you'll be broadcasting to the world. Yes, I... I know that, Elizabeth. Look, I'd just, I'd just like you to listen to it, that's all. But yes, I realise it's going to clash with the start of Hapodrome. <laughs> but but you, you, could, you could give it a miss? You will. Oh, good. What? No, I meant give Hapodrome a miss. <laughs> I know you like Enoch and, and, and Ramsbottom. <laughs> hear them any time. Y yes, yes, I realise you can hear me any time as well, but <laughs> that, that's not the point. This time I should be on the wireless. Look, all I'm saying is... Uh, just a minute, Elizabeth. Come in. Mr. Van Rien, the engineer wants us to stand by now. Should be on the air in a few minutes. Yes, all right, Pike. Tell him I'm just coming. Right, oh, Mr. Van Rien. Look, Elizabeth. You, you know, you are, being, you are being a bit unreasonable. I, I, Elizabeth? Elizabeth? Hello? Oh, really? Ah, oh, come along, Captain Mannering. It shouldn't be long now. I've got your script here, sir. Thank you, Wilson. Just been phoning Elizabeth, telling her about the broadcast. Ah, yes. <laughs> Did you say good luck? No. Didn't even say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> well, quiet, everybody. I think we'll just have a little listening to the Q programme, and then we'll be able to see how we're going. <laughs> That is singing by Londoners sheltering in the Aldwych tube station. <laughs> Deep below ground, on the platforms, on the rails, on the hard escalator stairs, out of reach of Nazi bombers over London in their nightly raids. But as you can hear, they are certainly not downhearted. Are we downhearted? Listen to that, Wilson. Make sure you realize that Hitler will have to pull a lot more stops out before he can break the indomitable British spirit. Yes, indeed, sir. Now, according to my running order, Hong Kong is next, and then they come over to us. And I reckon that could be in about three minutes, so relax for a moment, but of course, don't go away. Miss Manreen, do you think if I asked the engineer, he'd let me listen to Happy Drone while we're waiting? <laughs> it must have just started on the other programme. Of course he wouldn't, you stupid boy. Anyway, my wife will be listening, so she'll be able to tell you what happened. It's a good programme, that Happy Drone. Yeah, it's my favourite. <laughs> that Enoch's ever so funny, Mr. Manreen. <laughs> really? He makes you laugh, doesn't he, Uncle Arthur? What? Oh, yeah, yes, he does sometimes, yes. The girl in the sweet shop thinks I'm just like him. What, like Eustace? His hmm? name's Enoch, not oh, Eustace. No. <laughs> hey, have you heard my impersonation of him? No, I can't say I have. No. Well, listen then. Mm. Let me tell you! <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of that, then? Well, to be quite honest, not a lot. <laughs> I can do greet the garbo as well. <laughs> I want to be alone. I want to be alone. If you go on doing a present like that, son, I should think. <laughs> There's every chance you will be allowed to be alone. <laughs> Permission to speak, sir. Yes, sir. I think they're running a bit late. You know, we used to say that about the world in Dervishes. See, when they was attacking us and we fired at them with our muskets, they used to turn and run, but mainly they used to get shot. And we used to say they were running a bit late. <laughs> yes. 
Mind you, I think Joseph's got something, Wilson. He ought to have been on the air by now. What's happening, engineer? Uh, don't worry, I'm, I'm just waiting for the standby light. It should be through at any minute. Good. Right, stand by, everyone. Remember, when I get to my final speech, give me plenty of room. <laughs> You know, Wilson, I rather enjoy that final speech. Yes, sir. It is rather moving. Gives me a warm glow right here in the chest. Gives me a pain as well. <laughs> Only a wee bit lower down. <laughs> Just think, Mr. Manning. You'll be the last one to speak before the King. Do you think he'll be listening? Oh, yes. Yeah. And the Queen. And Princess Elizabeth. And Princess Margaret Rose. And the corgis. <laughs> I don't think uh, we'll worry too much about them, Doctor. Well, I still haven't had a standby light. I'll just have another listen to our programme. Wait a minute, Bert. You sure you've got the right programme? Well, I'm certain of it. This is the home service. This is London. His Majesty King George the Sixth. What about us? What, what's going on? Hello, Warmington. I'm awfully sorry, chap. Hong Kong overwhelm. We had to cut you out. Well, after all, I mean, we, we, we couldn't keep His Majesty waiting, could we? <laughs> really? What a confounded cheek. I must say the King always sounds so friendly, doesn't he? <laughs> My sister Sissy thinks the world of him. Yes. All right, Godfrey. At this precise moment, we're not questioning your sister's loyalty to the monarch. <laughs> the point is, why is he speaking and not me? <laughs> Because he is the king. You only think he are. <laughs> In that episode of Dad's Army, based on the original television series by Jimmy Perry and David Croft, you heard Arthur Lowe's Captain Mannering, John the Measure Sergeant Wilson, Clive Dunn, Corporal Jones, John Laurie, Private Fraser, Arnold Ridley, Private Godfrey, Ian Lavender, Private Pike, Frank Thornton, the BBC producer, Larry Martin, Private Walker, and Roger Gartland as Bert. Ten Seconds From Now was adapted for radio by Harold Snowd and Michael Knowles and produced by John Dyer.